It's March 3rd, 1974. A Turkish Airlines DC-10 takes off from Orly Airport in Paris, bound for London. Just minutes into the flight, a large explosion rocks the plane, sending it into an uncontrollable dive towards the countryside below. All 346 passengers and crew on board are killed, making it, at the time, the deadliest plane crash in history. Just two years earlier, a similar incident had occurred, yet that plane landed with no casualties, leaving the question, why was this flight so deadly? By the end of the 1960s, three manufacturers, Boeing, McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed, were in fierce competition to be the worldwide leader in passenger air travel. Boeing, with its iconic 747, was the clear leader, with McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed playing for second place. American Airlines were looking for a wide-bodied jet that could carry up to 400 passengers yet take off from a regular runway. Lockheed announced its L-1011 TriStar would meet the airline's specifications. McDonnell Douglas also announced that, yes, it could also build a suitable plane, but theirs would be better and built faster. No doubt impressed by McDonnell Douglas's pitch, American and United Airlines opted for the company's new plane, the DC-10 while TWA and Eastern Airlines chose the Lockheed. On August 29, 1970, the DC-10 took to the skies for its maiden flight, a full two years before the Lockheed TriStar. The race had been won, but at what cost? On the 12th of June, 1972, American Airlines Flight 96 departed Detroit, Michigan en route to Buffalo, New York. The DC-10 was less than a year old and in excellent condition. Carrying only 56 passengers and 11 crew, Flight 96 climbed into the evening sky. And then it happened. A powerful explosion rocked the plane over the town of Windsor, Ontario. In an instant, all the air rushed out of the fuselage. Everything that wasn't tied down rushed towards the back of the plane, where, to the immense horror of the crew, a large hole had opened in the floor. In the cockpit, Captain Bryce McCormick and his crew thought they had struck another plane. One engine was dead, they had no rudder control, but had full control of the hydraulics. Flight 96 miraculously landed with no casualties, and the cause of the incident soon became apparent. The rear cargo door had somehow opened during the flight. The opening had immediately caused all air to rush out of the cargo hold. Although the cabin hold depressurized, the passenger cabin above did not. The difference in pressure was so severe that the cabin floor could not handle it and collapsed. Underneath the cabin floor, hydraulic cables transport the pilot's commands to the rudder, engines and other components. The collapse of the floor severed these cables, increasing the difficulty of controlling the plane. But why did the cargo door blow out? To increase storage space, the DC-10's door was designed to open outwards. Once the door was closed, hook-shaped latches would attach to the bottom of the door frame. An electric motor then drives the latches clockwise until they are in place. The door is then locked from the outside by a ground handler. Prior to the takeoff from Detroit, the handler had a problem closing the door. A supervisor told him, however, not to worry, as the external pressure during the flight would close the door shut. Not surprisingly, this did not happen. As the plane reached an altitude of 11,750 feet, the pressure acting on the door caused the bolts to fail, and the door blew out. As a result of the investigation, the National Transportation Safety Board recommended that the Federal Aviation Administration require McDonnell Douglas to fix the design of the cargo door. A further recommendation was made to install vents in the cabin floor. These would relieve the pressure and enable the pilots to maintain control should such a depressurization occur again. The FAA, however, decided not to mandate either proposed change. Instead, McDonnell Douglas issued a non-binding service bulletin requesting, not mandating, that DC-10 operators install a small window through which baggage handlers could confirm that the door's locking pins were in place. On March the 3rd, 1974, Orly Airport was in turmoil. Employees at British European Airways had gone on strike for more pay ahead of their merger with BOAC.
passengers that had been scheduled with BEA scrambled to find alternate arrangements. At 11am, Turkish Airlines Flight 981 arrived from Istanbul with 167 passengers on board. 50 passengers disembarked while the plane took on an additional 200 plus, bringing the total number of passengers aboard to 335. While the passengers boarded the plane, baggage handler Mohammed Mahmoudi checked on the rear cargo door. He closed the door, then got word that the warning light had gone out in the cabin. All was good. However, he did not check the new viewing windows to confirm that the locking pins were in place. It was not explicitly his job to do this. The Turkish Airlines grand engineer whose job it was, was away on training. In his absence, another grand engineer was supposed to check, but he never showed up. Minutes later, the plane took off, and as it reached 11,500 feet, the cargo door blew open. Just like the incident two years prior, air rushed out of the cargo area. The cabin floor violently collapsed, ejecting three rows of seats and their unfortunate occupants. The total failure of the door severed all the cables associated with the flight controls, and from that point on, Flight 981 was doomed. The plane began hurtling towards the ground, accelerating at a speed of 362 knots, or 416 miles an hour. Any faster and the plane could break up in mid-air. With the control cables severed, there was nothing the pilots could do to save the plane. Just after 12.41, Turkish Airlines Flight 981 ploughed into the Ermanonvur forest at a speed of 486 miles an hour. The DC-10 disintegrated as it cut a one kilometer path through the forest. Local police and firefighters arrived on the scene expecting to find some survivors. However, all they could see were plane parts and body parts everywhere. It soon became apparent that there were no survivors. The cabin door, pieces of the cabin floor and the ejected seats were found in a nearby farmer's field. Charles Miller, the NTSB investigator on site, soon recognised that this was a repeat of the Windsor incident except this time it involved a fully loaded passenger jet. His first question was why had this accident killed everybody on board? It turned out that the number of passengers on board was the reason for the fatal accident. The extra weight of the passengers compared to the earlier flight caused a more total failure of the cabin floor. The NTSB was understandably upset that the recommendations it made after the Windsor incident had not been heeded. They could have prevented the Turkish Airlines disaster, but instead, McDonnell Douglas decided to ignore the possibility of the rear cargo door failing again. The manufacturer decided that human error was to blame, and just like the Windsor incident, tried to blame the baggage handler. The FAA, however, issued a mandatory airworthiness directive legally requiring the manufacturer to fix the faulty design or risk their planes being grounded. No serious incidents involving the DC-10 cargo door occurred again. Relatives of the victims won what was, at the time, the largest air disaster settlement for McDonnell Douglas. It would have been less expensive if the company had just fixed the issue in the first place. <laughs>